Edit audio. American traditional. Mm, love it. Oh, I love it too. It like carries everyone from zero to hero. <laughs> it just always looks good. I'm so mad about it. But then I don't like white boy American trad tattooers. So, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we were to talk stereotypes about it, bold will hold bitches and folks that believe that tattooing is going in the wrong direction. And oh my God, you use pen style machines. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Loyal to the coil, bro. Oh my God. Yeah. You don't hand draw all your images? Procreate? Wow. Not a real tattooer. <laughs> Assholes. But I'm gonna get it though. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Welcome to season two of The Teardown, a podcast hosted by me, Vegas Sink, hopefully, still your favorite polarizing tattooer. Every episode, I sit down and chat with amazing guest artists, and we dive in more intimately on the politics of the tattoo industry, as well as some topics I feel are more relevant in contemporary tattooing. So, Now that we're all set up, let's get started. Are you ready? Chris is a first-generation Barbadian immigrant who first moved to Canada to pursue a degree in illustration at OCAD University and then decided tattooing was worth continuing to suffer the cold for. Her artistic influences stem from her horror, manga, gothic aesthetics, metal music, pop culture, vintage erotica, and surrealism. She enjoys gin, long walks on the beach, and working in a community-minded space with leftist ideals. (laughs) <laughs> that is on our website clients are reading this i don't know if i proofread your bio before posting it i know a client bought me gin and i was like how do you know i like gin and they're like it's on the website oh, i'm getting hot <laughs> why are you like this i don't know <laughs> Okay, so uh, working at a leftist-minded space, being my tattoo shop, True Tattoos. How how do you like working there? I love it. It's so fun. (laughs) Where we don't proofread bios ahead of time. Where we don't proofread bios. And I've just been running wild on the internet for a year. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to have to look at everybody else's and see what's up now. Okay, let's have. There's a few icebreaker questions here for you. Although I'm sure I know some of these answers, but <laughs> what are things you like to do outside of tattooing? Um, I like to watch binge watch shows. I've been watching like a lot of true crime, Breaking Bad. It's been the latest thing I've been getting into. I like to, you know, go to dive bars. <laughs> and um, I would like to get like a hobby that's like still creative but not necessarily drawing or painting anymore i would like to get into pottery or something like that this year Mm. something tactile yeah that would be fun what would you make i feel like i'd have to start easy so like ashtrays and cups maybe (laughs) true but i would like to make like figures eventually but i feel like that's so hard it's like i feel it's like a very intimidating medium though because so much can go wrong at every step of the process that like and they can just like break yeah exactly (laughs) Exactly. And like the way that it can go wrong, there's like no going back. You just have to restart. I guess kind of like tattoos. You can't really go that wrong. (laughs) True. (laughs) I like stressful situations. What is your most painful tattoo and your least painful tattoo? Uh, Most painful. I want to say the top of my foot was pretty bad. But like my armpit was kind of brutal too. True. Yeah. I don't know. There was different kinds of pain, but. I don't know. It's all tolerable to a certain degree, so I don't really know. Least painful would be anything, like, on the outer arm is not too bad. Mm, Yeah. You are, like, the bionic woman, though, so (laughs) that makes sense. (laughs) How would you describe your tattooing style in one word? Oh, in one word? Um, That's tough. Uh, I'll just go with gothic. I'll just say gothic. (laughs) True. Yeah. On brand. So what made you want to get into tattooing, like, actually, like, and how long have you been tattooing for? So I always liked tattoos. Like, from the time I was a kid and I saw people with them, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But I wasn't so sure about it as, like, a career. Then, as I said, I went to OCAD and did the illustration program, and it was 
kind of out of touch in a way. It focused a lot on print media, which is pretty much not a thing. So like a lot of album covers, magazine covers with the assignments, billboards and things that have been long replaced by photography. So I finished the program and also had the experience of not really finding my artistic voice through the whole program. I was kind of just doing what different profs were pulling me towards. So I finished and I had this degree and I was just like, well, yes, I'm going to work at Starbucks because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> then I started doing zines and a lot of them had like trad inspired tattoo art in them. And at the shows I was tabling at, people would be like, oh, do you tattoo? I'd love to get tattooed by you. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't realize people would actually want this stuff. Then I had a friend who was working at a questionable shop and they were looking for apprentices and she was like I don't know if you would be really interested but you know you should come in and say hi and that was about it so I've been tattooing like post apprenticeship for I guess uh, this is the third year and my apprenticeship was like a year and a half yeah and what was your experience at OCAD like be honest like I said out of touch really racist in many ways <laughs> to the point where I like you know I, like I mentioned I do a lot of gothic style tattoos like I like the darker side of things visually and I had a prof be like why don't you do black stuff like mm. what well, I don't get why you're doing this kind of thing you should just do black art and I'm like uh, how is it not black art though a black person's making it yeah <laughs> what is black stuff I don't know. I don't know. What do you want me to do? Like a bunch of cornrow art or something? Like I, I just <laughs> slavery. I don't know. I was like, I don't think that we have the same perspective on what would be black art anyway. I don't know what she means by that. But yeah, it was yeah very isolating. I didn't get close to too many people there because like in my program, I think there was only like three black people total, and one wasn't even in my year, so I didn't really like have a lot of other black people there and it was mostly like white folks and like East Asian students. Yeah. I don't hear good experiences from art schools. It's always like the death of art pretty much, or like the death of the artist and uninspiring. Yeah. They beat the creativity right out of you. <laughs> yeah. How old were you when you, for, when you got your first tattoo and what was it? I'm assuming you weren't were you in Barbados at the time or? Uh, no, I got my first one in Canada. I was 17 and I was going to McDonald's and there was a tattoo shop next to the McDonald's. And I was just like, let me see if I can pull a fast one on these people. I just really wanted to get it. <laughs> so I went to, I don't know if it's still around. Maybe I shouldn't call the name of it. But um, yeah, he didn't ID me or anything, but he did say like, oh, I don't really tattoo a lot of black people, but I think it should show up. And it was just the words come as you are on my rib cage. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not asking you to do it in brown ink or something. This is weird. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. But I didn't really want to ask too many questions because, like I said, I was underage and rather intimidated, honestly. So we just get to it. And at the end of it, he was like, oh, you did really well. The ribs are super painful. And I'm like, well, I wish you told me that before we started, but I guess whatever. That's funny. You want to get that tattoo covered up, no? Or do you care? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I don't... I'm of two minds. Like, it makes me laugh because I don't even like it. But it, <laughs> the make me laugh part makes me kind of like it. Because <laughs> the font is so weird, too. I don't know what was going on. It's just not a cute tattoo, and it's kind of cringe, but... <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you kind of talked about it a little bit, but what has your experience being tattooed been like, especially as, like, a Black woman? Mostly, like normal like you know the type of tattoos I get they tend to be on the bolder side and black and gray so I haven't had too much of the back and forth about oh you can't get this style color or fine line where their artist is gonna pretty much shit all over them and be like your skin is a problem I haven't had too much of that but I still have like faced like misogyny like racism where people I don't think they want to tattoo you per se, but they're not saying anything, but in that they're not saying anything at all, you know, like you'd walk into a shop, look at the artist's work or whatever and choose someone. And then you don't even like talk to them through the whole session, really. It's just very impersonal. Yeah. Then there's the sexual harassment as well. Mm. Just 
just those wonderful experiences. Is it the, still the same now since you become a tattoo artist? Do you think it's a little bit different? Maybe it's a little bit different because you're getting it done by people that we know. But like, let's say for people that like you don't like don't necessarily know, like, do they know you're a tattoo artist or like that conversation doesn't um, even happen? Honestly, since I started working at True, I've, I guess I've been like going to the people who've already passed the test, like you said. So I, I'm usually getting tattooed by racialized folks, queer folks who have a little bit more ethics, I guess, compared to like cis white tattooers who just are on some next shit. But um, I haven't really been tattooed by anyone who didn't know it was a tattooer like in a while. I guess the last time I did it had been at a convention and they knew I worked there, but they were still mostly sexually harassing me. So... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that would have been the last time. I was actually thinking about walking into a shop the other day to get like my ditch tattooed because I had, like some thorns or something in there. But I don't know. Like remembering that experience of seeing like who was in the shop, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I feel like potentially dealing with some weird harassment again. So I'm kind of more conscious of where I get tattooed these days and by whom. Yeah, I mean, for me, being like a light skin, like and a biracial person, like I didn't, I obviously didn't have, no, I had it once, which was really bizarre. Like in the past before I started tattooing and getting tattooed. And I was like, damn, like colorism and anti-blackness is so pervasive. Like I went and got tattooed by an artist who I was working in a shop with them and they were adding color to my tattoo. And they're like, you know, a lot of the color might not show up on your skin though. So as it heals, it might not be there anymore. And I'm like, (laughs) Ma'am, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there was an artist who posted pictures of their work on dark skin recently, and the people were like barely olive toned. I was oh. like, that's what we call dark skin now. <laughs> so I guess it's so bizarre. Some people, anything like less than ivory is just so hard to work with. <laughs> Which is so interesting because, like, if you tattoo enough uh, melanated folks, black folks, folks with dark skin, Everyone takes ink and colored ink. So like color on tattoos in general is just a complicated process. And sometimes it's like, like there's formulas that you follow to ensure that it works out well, but sometimes it's just like figuring it out as you go. And it's the same for like white people and light skin, like really light skin people where like there are colors where I assumed were going to be much easier to deal with and they, and it wasn't. And then I've like tattooed colors on like darker skin folks, brown folks, like melanated skin folks, like yellows where everybody's always like, I know I can't get yellow, but then I'll do a yellow on somebody that's like brown skin. Mm -hmm. And it's like in there and it's just, it's color theory. It's like choosing the right undertones. It's just those components, which as artists, we should already know or be trying to figure out. I'm so tired of the conversation. It's, it's boring I know. And it's so sad when people come in and they're already like walking in that you're going to have a problem doing things on them. And I'm like, I don't know who told you these things. That sucks that you feel that way. Yeah. And even with black and gray, like I still get clients that come in being like, oh, I don't know what's fully going to show. So maybe if you do it this way, and I'm like, none of it's going to be an issue, but black and gray is, it's just a staple. It's going to work on everybody. Like I don't, but I guess you get degraded for so long that you kind of come in like that no matter what the situation is. What is your favorite style of tattooing and what is your least favorite style of tattooing? I like a lot of traditional tattoos, actually, like American traditional, looking at them. Um, I really like the Japanese bodysuits, too. I think that's so cool. (laughs) Um, My least favorite, I honestly have never gone into watercolor tattoos. Like, (laughs) I just can't with it. I just think it ends up healing like a bruise half the time, depending on how much, like, lines were in it to hold it together. Like, I have a a friend who has a, what is it, like a blueberry on the bum? And it just looks like a blue blob after a few years Mm -hmm. in that style. I just do not get it. (laughs) What's your favorite and least favorite? Well, I think you know what my least favorite is. <laughs> I think we all know what my least favorite is. Oh, yeah. The ignorance. <laughs> I fucking hate an ignorance style. Boy. Okay. I like the concept. I like a well-done ignorance style. I like an imagery that's obnoxious 
and like disrespectful and gaudy. I like that. Yeah. But when it's well done. And I also can appreciate, I think some of the, ta- not all your tattoos, but some tattoos that you do for like, it's like goth shit. That's what you call it. Yeah. Could be considered ignorance style where like there's a particular kind of line work that mm-hmm. you engage with. And I can appreciate and like that because that's what it's supposed to look like. But at the same time, I've seen you do fine line stuff. I've seen you do lettering and like have good foundations. So it's like, I know that you're, you're doing that work purposely and intentionally. Like there's an intentionality with that style. And uh, as well as like other tattooers that I follow who have intentionality with their artwork but I could always tell who, the ignorant style that like, it's ignorant because you don't actually know how to tattoo. <laughs> and the imagery is not that exciting either. I, I also don't like hyperrealism. Controversial uh, me take. Me either, actually. I don't like it either. I respect and appreciate the technique that goes into it because it's so complicated and so difficult. But I'm like not excited about it. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah, my favorite's American traditional. And I like ornamental tattoos aesthetically I like them but yeah American Mm -hmm. traditional is like my favorite and then I like the sort of illustrative color work that has come out of like America done by like Mm -hmm. black black tattooers yeah that stuff's nice yeah like very heavily saturated color with heavy and bold lining that's like specifically curated for like melanated folks I like that it's interesting well, I mean, also, what are what are your thoughts on ignorance style tattooing? It's, <laughs> it's the topic. No, letting me get away with that one. Um, uh, you know, you're right in that I think a lot of people use it as a crutch to not actually give a fuck about how to actually tattoo properly. Mm-hmm. And I don't really think that's the most ethical. Because, I mean, I think it's one thing to, like, okay, the lines aren't super clean or whatever. But when you can look at something and tell that half of it's going to be blown out and the other half is falling out, I think that's weird. Like, you should at least know how to do that. I don't really get just saying it's a style. It just shows that you don't care to learn, really. And even drawing-wise, sometimes I'm like, Really? <laughs> Because the drawing is so is so weak, you know, they just there's just no effort. But you know, if you're like a conventionally attractive white person, you can oh. get away with it. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's so popular amongst like queer tattooers. I feel yeah. like that's like where like it, its niche is. So like they could also ride the coattails of being a white queer. So like partially marginalized, so that it's enough for them to be like well, I'm poor and I can't afford to do an apprenticeship. It's like, honey, you will have a much easier time finding an apprenticeship than folks of racial, different racial demographics and backgrounds. It's just laziness. (laughs) It sort of feels like, hey, if you can get away with it, right? No one's making them do better. People just accept it and praise them for it. I just wonder though, like what is the longevity of that? Because we know an artist who was originally an ignorant style tattooer and now they do incredible like black and gray and and large scale pieces. I don't know if I'd call it like American traditional, but like lean towards more of that, but like illustrative for sure. Because I think at some point you have to say, what is going to have longevity? How am I going to be able to sustain myself long-term? Are there any financial benefits to this, right? Like, I mean, it's still popular for sure, but I feel like it's already less popular than it was say like, five years ago even Mm. like ignorance style like a lot of people do end up getting some of that covered because I think it's one thing to have like some ignorance style tattoos there's people who went like over the top with having like most of their body covered in that style it doesn't age with you well I'm not one person to be like oh what are those tattoos gonna look like when you age but they're very like immature they don't grow with you I don't think very well. Like, was it, yeah, it was Jalen who was talking about, like, they've covered so many of those tattoos, <laughs> you know, like people do get them covered eventually. And I mean, even from my own experience, I've done cover-ups on tattoos that are well done. Like they're good tattoos. And I'm like, I yeah. actually don't even know how I can cover this up because it's technically well done. The imagery is good. It's exactly what they wanted, but they have just like aged out of it. Right. So the argument could be made like, well, anything could eventually somebody will grow out of it. But I don't know. Like, I think that there's a particular kind of 
like a person that will age with that style and and like it like you know folks who are like punks let's just say like mm-hmm. like that is who they are at their core and even when they're in their 40s and even if they end up having children or don't or whatever the case is they're going to be yeah. happy with that but then there are folks who and this is coming from a perspective of like working in the industry for over a decade i know when somebody's coming in a little more in their fifis a yeah. little more a little more, <laughs> a little more depressed a little a little more I don't care about my body right now because I don't care about myself right now because I'm not in a good place. And so they make a lot of decisions in terms of like body modification, right? People cut their hair and people might shave their whole eyebrows off. And those things are reversible, but like tattoos are permanent in a way, not that they can't be removed or covered, but it's kind of like, I don't know. I kind of, I look at it from like the principle or the ethic of like, even though they are who they are right now. And this is like, and I have to honor that and like, whatever, there should be some kind of conversation. Because if I'm having conversations with clients about certain artwork that they want to get done and being like, okay, like this style is already kind of aged over the years. It's going to become more aged. Like this is how you might feel about it. And having those really intentional conversations with my clients, like are those folks who are doing a particular kind of style having those conversations? Do they care? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because they like, not to say, you know, people say it's gatekeeping to even refuse certain placements on like super young people or people who don't have a lot of work. I don't ever really see that with ignorant style tattooers. Like they will blast your face if you have nothing else, if they want to, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like they do some stuff where I'm just like, ah, that's, that seems unethical, but I mean... Who am I to judge? Do you remember that woman that got the Drake tattoo written across her forehead? Yeah, I do. Yes. Would that would we consider that ignorant style tattoo? Because it's well done, but the ethics of that was fucked. Like that artist did not give a fuck about her. Yeah, that was shocking. It was. Ignorant. I wonder what ever became of her. Yeah, it was just ignorant. <laughs> it was a well done ignorant tattoo. <laughs> I wonder if she still has it. I don't know. I've been trying to find it. I haven't. I think social media has made like tattooing kind of weird in the sense that I can tell a lot of people are getting tattoos just to go viral for having this like wild tattoo. And sometimes, I mean, yes, yeah, one thing to like post something, be proud of it, like a massive back piece that's super nice or whatever. But then there's just the attention kind of seeking stuff like the graphic porn tattoos, like somewhere you can't really mm. hide it. Like say it's on your forearm. You're not going to wear sweaters every summer, you know, and just like, yeah, the Drake on the forehead or Shorty that got the like 50 stars on her face or whatever. And sometimes I don't know how to like feel about that interaction, you know, of like social media clout and tattooing Mm. anything just to like get some clout. And even like folks who like have their clients like buck naked to like take an image of a tattoo and maybe just little dots to cover their private parts. And I'm just like, these are people and like, do they have conversations about consent about whether or not, like, let's say it no longer aligns with them as a person to be like, Hey, I no longer want this out there, but there's digital footprint. So it doesn't matter even if the artist takes it off the page. I do wonder about that. Like, I guess some placements and pieces is kind of hard to show it without like getting some like breast or like pubic area in the shot but some of them are like purposefully sexualized and you can tell when that's the case and it's very like weird when someone's whole account is just that Mm. (laughs) and then you have to wonder like how those conversations go do they even like show people what kind of pictures they're planning to post ahead of time I don't know and it's always like I won't say only exclusively men but it is always like men behind those accounts For the most part. And I guess you can say, I guess maybe the clients don't mind being perceived that way, but I do think it sets a weird precedent. So I don't know. Definitely. And then it influences folks, right? And other tattooers and other artists to think that that's okay, especially when we don't know what the actual process is or like who the clientele is. Yeah. What is one thing you never want to tattoo again? (laughs) Um, anything with the EKG monitor in it, like the little heartbeat things. <laughs> oh my god! Then it has like a skyline in it and daffodils, and it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, I can't with that. <laughs> I just tattooed that. I just did that, on and I hadn't done an EKG heart. I swear, in like 
two years and I thought it was done. Uh, this client's lovely though, but yeah, I, I, I did it. And I was like, oh damn, okay. This is so popular. What is the one thing I would never tattoo again? Let's see if you know me. Snakes? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't care. It's not about style wise. It's not about, I think they're played out. Like I can't, if I have to fucking draw another snake again, it'll be too soon. You do such nice ones too. That's the funny thing. I don't think so, but thank you. I always feel like when I do them, they lie a little more flat than I would like them to. And I know what Mm. the issue is. I'm very like, when it comes to like patterns and stuff, I like things to be um, symmetrical and like proportioned properly. But with snakes, their scales aren't. Like I'm looking even at my my large snake tattoo that I'm getting done. And I'm like, yeah, these scales are like, it gives it movement, even though these scales aren't perfect. But I'm like, I couldn't. Yeah. Oh, and um, anything that's a mythical creature. <laughs> how am I supposed to know how to draw this thing? We don't got real pictures. <laughs> like, all we have are illustrations and a vague description of what it's supposed to look like. I don't know what a fucking phoenix is. It's like what? A chicken? It's supposed to be like a chicken. With- yeah, a peacock chicken on fire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually don't really like doing phoenixes either, actually. Yeah, or like um, was it dragons. Oh, I can't. Dragons are cool. Dragons are cool. I don't want to tattoo them, though. <laughs> I don't. I always end up feeling like they all look the same. Kind of, yeah. They they do. So Riri Stars is the intro topic, which is fitting because you're from Barbados and that's your crown jewel. Although I, I argue that you are the crown jewel of Barbados. Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there was a time that Rihanna's tattoos had made a significant impact culturally on tattooing? Yes. They, uh, like, almost every shorty had the ISIS under the sternum, you know, that one. Like, everyone, like, felt no ways about copying copying that. I don't know if it's still as popular, but for a few years there, it was not uncommon to see people, like, Getting it even at during my apprenticeship, I remember seeing like a couple of them walk in with that as a reference. Also, like the little hand one, the what is it supposed to be? Hannah inspired Mm -hmm. hand one she has. People were getting a lot of those, but I feel like that kind of collided with the mandala fad of the 2010s anyway. Another one I didn't realize was a tribute to her was the birth year on the front of the ankle. Yes, that was her. Yeah, that was her. And I guess like earlier in the 2000s, the stars down the back was also like her. So she she was kind of writing the trends, but she has definitely a few that inspired people like the. Oh, yeah. The Roman numerals on the shoulder. Like oh she's God. one celebrity people like really enjoy her, her tattoos. And I guess her style in general, because she had the shorties and red hair and the pixie cut and all that for a while too. very, very impactful visually. I don't think there's ever been a celebrity copied that much for their tattoos. Like, even if folks aren't getting the same imagery, and I'm not to say that she was the first one to do it, because let's be honest, I think that the people with, like, the most creative ideas for tattoos are, like, have sort of set the trend for tattooing has been tattoo artists, right? Yes. It's body modification, so we're more explorative. We do things like... no. The average person is not getting a tattoo under their jawline the way that I might. Right? No, no. So whenever a client's like, what's your most painful? I'm like, here, but you don't have to worry about it because you're never going to get it. <laughs> like, well, I might, know? but I'm scared now. <laughs> you, but like the the normies, like the... Yeah, yeah, they're not going to do that. Even like an armpit tattoo, people are like, why would you ever? <laughs> I think that, so we set the trend for a while. So I'm not going to say that Rihanna was probably the first to do anything and like, like anything that gets popped off. Obviously, it was inspired by something else. But I do think that that placement, the sternum, the underboob, and the shaping and the framing of that Mm -hmm. inspired a lot more people to get creative with that sort of placement. And I think it was surprising because she was kind of considered like a fashion girly. No one thought she would get such a big tattoo. And it made people think, oh, a big tattoo can still be like feminine or whatever. Oh, my gosh. Was it Eve that had the paw prints on the titties? Yeah, it was Eve. Yeah. (laughs) She inspired uh, the 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 '90s generation for yes. for a lot of those. Oh wait, wait. So black women leading the charge in trends as usually. <laughs> as for you, as always, no credit, but leading the way. Yes. <laughs> the number on the ankle is 
probably still one of the most popular tattoos. It has not yeah, died out. It is. Like just the birth year tattoo and that old English font in general. People are really into that. You know what though? I <laughs> So now uh, we're tattooing 2,000 babies, right? I don't like it with the 2,000 birth years. It doesn't like hit the same. It don't <laughs> it hit. The same. I'm like, you should be embarrassed. They, like They need to get like a new font for theirs. I don't know. The gothic one doesn't really like look cute with 2003 in it. No, at all. And it still trips me out that we're able to tattoo people that were born in 2000. I know. When you double take on the consent form and it's 2004, and you're like, wait, what? It's like, if you don't know where you were during 9-11, then I don't think you should be getting this. You weren't even born yet. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, and it was interesting with even Rihanna's hand. She had gotten originally a, um, I think it was like the traditional hand poking. Yeah, yeah. And then she didn't like it or it faded out or it fell out. I'm not sure what the whole thing was. That, but it was so funny because the picture was kind of like she was like smoking weed and like <laughs> getting it done. But then she got it redone over. It was kind of a lot that was happening there, actually. Yeah, she went from one, <gasps> I guess, appropriate tattoo to another. <laughs> the AK, the the gun on the finger. Was that her too? Oh yeah. Is it on the finger? She has a little AK somewhere. I don't remember where it is. Not us really realizing how much she's had an impact on tattooing. Damn, this title is yeah, really, it's right? really on part. I also think it, her like getting tattooed kind of coincided with like social media like exploding when everyone was like new to Instagram and stuff. So like that paired with the tattoo trend being more like visible, I think it was just a n- good timing for that. Because now I feel like social media is different. <laughs> and honestly, maybe even just seeing like a black woman who had an alternative style too, because I, I remember like I was an emo kid for, for, you know, a little while. And like, I was definitely, I've always been like an alternative person style wise. And it was kind of cool to see like a black girl out there. Like she started off very like norm core and then yeah. very quickly was alternative and sort of normalized that normalized having all those like tattoos being like hypersexual while kind of rejecting like hypersexuality in a sense, yes. like very much centered on empowering herself and her body. And like, even now has accelerated that. <laughs> where nobody can she's shame pregnant, her. She's still like, yeah, I'm out here naked and what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after this short break. What tattoos do you have that were slash are trendy? Um, I said to the editor, I was like, I don't think that Chris will have any because she's kind of cool that way. Like kind of has had a style and stayed with it. But maybe I could. Oh, the writing on your ribs, I guess a little bit. But like, yeah, that was very of that year, like 2011, 2012, 10, maybe. Yeah. Um. Now There's got to be something else. No, I'm like literally thinking of your body because I've seen you partially naked and this is at the shop. So I feel like I have a pretty good idea of what's like, <laughs> what you have. Just naked everywhere. <laughs> I can see your full legs. I can see your full back. I can see Yeah, I guess I don't really have like trendy, trendy ones. Dang. Maybe like the spider web, but I don't know. I feel like that's kind of timeless. I wouldn't consider that trendy. Yeah, that's the thing. Like some of them are like definitely things you see like other people getting, especially the trad ones. But I'm like, does that count as trendy? I don't know. Maybe. Mm. So you have nothing. I guess the maybe the angel wrap that I have, the eyes and the wing one. I feel like those realistic angels are kind of in. The really cool one that's like turns into flames? Yeah. Girl, be serious. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. I've never seen that tattoo done the way that it is. What can I say real to this game? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I have a few in a, in a very shameful way, uh, pretty on brand for, for the biracials, for the light skins. <laughs> I have a kiss on my chest in red ink. Or is it? Oh, my God. I still can't believe you have this. And I have, oh, yeah, this is it. I have cheetah print coming from my hip 
up my sternum into like the middle of my chest. That is pretty fucking like, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I like it though somehow. (laughs) It's going to get covered soon, but yeah, that's definitely trendy. Oh, I mean, it's covered now. But remember I told you about, I had my second tattoo. So I had a uh, a rose on the neck that's, does not get any more basic. That's covered now though. Which is funny because it's covered with a pomegranate and you would think like, but it's much cooler, you know, (laughs) being like, yeah. So my second tattoo was love on my wrist with stars coming up my hand on each side of my hand. It was like supposed to be delicate and like vulnerable. And then I was supposed to get strength on the other wrist and it was going to be like bricks that were like, look like they were kind of falling apart, but they were still standing strong because that's strength. (laughs) Always remember love and always remember strength and thank fucking God I was never had enough money to get it. That is just so off brand for you now that I'm like, who were you? (laughs) What was going on? Right. (laughs) I think those are really it. I mean, I have like a lot of people who I've dated name on me. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will say there are more people out there with my name tattooed than I have names tattooed on me. Yeah, I know. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember all of them, to be honest. I'm screaming. I don't have anyone's name tattooed on me. Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, just for this story. <laughs> really like, I just feel like you. I have to. Well, there's Jacob. You can get his name. Yeah, but he doesn't want me to do it. He doesn't want you to do a lot of things. And, and you do it anyways. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> Damn. Okay, so I'm the only one that's like, oh, I guess I got Betty Boop on the leg. That's about six Oh, I have a Betty Boop too. So I guess that counts. The Betty Boop, it's interesting because mine takes up my whole calf, as you know. And I had a Man, never... This is huge. I don't think I had ever really watched a full Betty Boop episode ever. And then... About five or six years ago, we found, I was with my friend and we found like this collection of old cartoons at Valley Village and we bought it and we were smoking, smoking some weed and we started watching it and girl, the way we were just mouth agaped watching, I'm like, this isn't, I have a caricature on my leg. Yeah. She's, she's iconic and who was, who she's inspired by is iconic but if I'm I'm watching it and they had the episodes were wild. They were misogynistic to her and then just racist. Always every episode is just like oh got God. the racism going on, her like running from men trying to get at her. It's a lot. And she's only supposed to be a kid too, so it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the only folks that had like really still like it are like old suburban white women i get complimented by them a lot for it yeah they love it and most of the people who i've tattooed boobs on are middle-aged white ladies so i kind of wanted to go through a list of types of tattoos and like the stereotypes attached to them Oh, boy. It's a fun little game. Don't be afraid to get controversial, Chris. Oh, no, not this. Lion head, roses, and a clock. Stereotype. Uh, Like a basic dude, I guess. Cishet white man. (laughs) Yeah. Goes to the gym. Who thinks he's kind of hood for some reason. (laughs) It's a little edgy. Couldn't think of anything else more creative. And has seen the no, but he thinks the he thinks it's really creative because the lion's wearing a crown and no one's ever done that before. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so silly. Animals don't wear crowns. That's so original. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's the king of a, the jungle. You get it? I'm like, yeah, crazy. <laughs> Looking for his his lioness, his queen. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> Black silhouettes of birds coming out of a feather. Um. Yeah, basic, but also someone who probably lives in a smaller Ontario town and they're kind of 10 years behind on trends. Yeah. <laughs> they're the ones who also want the dream catcher. Oh, <laughs> true. It definitely would be under the the category of Pinterest tattoos. Yes. It always represents for them freedom and escape and resilience. And I love that for them. But... 
There's got to be a better way. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. <laughs> Semicolons on here. So I won't say much, but uh, <laughs> people with mental health issues. Yeah, I just let them have at it. I don't have strong feelings. I get it. There have been some interesting iterations of it, though. With the I, butterfly wing? Yeah, or like putting it, adding it to like a watercolor. Like, I think I like... I like it because it could just be simple. It could just be like elegant. It could be, I mean, obviously time, hopefully timeless if the tattoo represents what it needs to. But I don't, I don't love the iterations of it all the time. Like how people try to get creative, I suppose. Oh, you know, I did one recently that was a lot going on with the semicolon in it. Yes, you did. It was interesting. I think that's also a conversation of people just slamming in as much symbolism as possible into one yeah. idea. And I'm just like, I never know that that's the best way to go about it. And it's always very, what you're trying to represent, it speaks to it instead of doing something that, like imagery that could represent something, but it's not so obvious, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like when you look at yeah. art and then you're like, when you could automatically tell what's trying to be said and what the messaging is rather than being more ambiguous and leaving the person yeah. to figure it out. I don't know. American traditional. <clears throat> love it oh i love it too it like carries everyone from zero to hero <laughs> it just always looks good i'm so mad about it but then i don't like white boy american trad tattooers so hmm yeah <laughs> uh i mean if we were to talk stereotypes about it bold will hold bitches and folks that believe that tattooing is going in the wrong direction and oh my god you use pen style machines Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> loyal to the coil bro oh my god yeah you don't hand draw all your images procreate wow not a real tattooer <laughs> assholes but i'm gonna get it though <laughs> i just don't get it too <laughs> <laughs> we're black is different <laughs> I <don't, laughs> right it looks so good on brown and brown skin i love it i love it too i think that like i hadn't seen a lot of black folks get american traditional tattoos because obviously they've been gatekept from the industry but now at least for me anyways because i do so much of it because i'm like black like mixed black clients have been like can i get this i've gotten so many black people that have, that have started to get american traditional and they like it so score one for us yes keep getting it people keep getting it infinity symbols you know i actually haven't done one. oh no that's a lie i did one last year i was gonna say I haven't done one in a while but it was like an infinity symbol with a feather mm. with kids names in it mm. <laughs> i didn't really get where the feather came in if i'm honest but it's typically it's been a while it's imagery that's been a while for i've done that feather with the infinity symbol i recently did infinity symbol going into nate i always it's always infinity symbols now with names yeah, also kind of a Pinterest tattoo. Mm -hmm. Medusa head. I've heard that that's supposed to represent like sexual assault survivors. I didn't know that. I found that out later than one should, I guess. I mean, I have one, but I didn't know it meant that. I didn't either. I don't know. Maybe I wonder if like things are assigned meaning over time just because it's somebody didn't want. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't think that its start was that, but I wonder if Yeah, I don't think so either. Over time, people start to make correlations and share their stories, and then that's just end up, what ended up happening. The next one was going to be butterfly, and now, like, the trope attached to that is, like, the bisexual butterfly. The bisexuals <laughs> love butterfly tattoos. I didn't know that was, like, a, okay. I mean, sure. I wasn't so into butterfly tattoos till recently. Mm -hmm. Like, seeing the little fine line guys, I'm kind of like, okay, Kind of like breathe some life into it for me because before I wasn't really like super into them. I don't say I was into them or not into them, but I will say that I always like doing a colored butterfly on melanated skin. I always love yeah. The way well, it I mean, looks. you kill those; they look so nice. I just love the way that it looks, but like they're fine. I don't really have any like aversion to them. They're they're hard to they're do. They're so though. popular. Yeah, <laughs> if it's not fine line, and even if it is, because you want it to be symmetrical, you want it to be consistent. But then when you want need to like for monarch butterflies, but I also try to encourage people to get something other than a monarch butterfly, like the yeah. Alicia's butterfly is so cool looking. The monarchs are hard. Yeah, you gotta get all those little tiny dots. 
but then still fill it in black. It's just so much. Yeah. Roses. My stereotype for roses is people get roses because they don't know any other flower. Prove me wrong. I agree with that. They just wanted a flower and that's the go-to. I don't mind a rose tattoo. It's a classic, you know? I'm like, okay, whatever. (laughs) It's roses and lilies. They're the most popular, I feel like. Sunflowers are kind of like... Black people. Black people like sunflowers. Black people love lilies, sunflowers, and roses. Yeah, they just love flowers. Botanicals. But there are different kinds of roses, too, where I'm like always trying to encourage. I like a, I like the roses with the more rounded edges. So I, those, I think those are garden roses. Mm-hmm. I like those a lot better, better than like the classic rose. Sometimes like if you don't draw the rose right, it looks like a little cabbage. <laughs> Same for like um chrysanthemums. Like you got to be, I don't know, sometimes it's like cabbage. <laughs> Fine line tattoos. Mm, very Type A personality people seem to like those. Very particular, have a certain aesthetic. Just want it really cute and tiny and like little obscure places. I don't want to be too visible, but I don't want it to be too hidden either. I I want it to be impossibly small. As small as you can make it and then make it smaller than that. (laughs) (laughs) And then lower back tattoos. This is for the whores. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, I love those. (laughs) Haughty stuff. (laughs) Bad bitches. Only. Yeah, I'm so glad they're back. Girl, remember I messaged you and I'm kind of low-key, low-key thinking about getting a lower back tattoo. You must. I kind of thinking about getting something on the sides of mine. Side thigh? No, like um around the like, little weapon I have on my lower back. I'm like, maybe I should get some something around it. You mean other than the tattoo you have right now that Sam's working on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're unhinged. You're off the rails. (laughs) My back is never going to be finished. (laughs) So the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about was this tattoo gate. Have you heard of it? I've seen bits and pieces, but I don't know if I have the full story. So tattoo gate was this woman came online to sort of discuss what her experience was during a consultation process for getting a tattoo. This tattoo artist has a tier system for designing. So there's three tiers of $1,600, $3,000, and $6,000. The $1,600, you get one drawing and no reiterations. Like, you can't adjust the drawing. The second one, you can adjust it, like, once. The third one, you can adjust as many times as you want. Like, it's a complete collaborative process. First of all, the consultation was $180, and then the deposit's, like, $1,000. What? So you could walk away paying about, we don't even know how much her tattoos cost. And to be fair, the artist's work was mid at worst. Really? Mid at, she does line work and watercolor. So she uses a a, a total of probably three needles. Okay. And the tattoo probably takes her an hour and a half, two hours tops. It's kind of crazy. That's crazy. She sent, so during the consultation, she gives the artist two reference images of a fox and she wants some flowers. The fox is like a full body fox coming down. And during the consultation, she doesn't mention it, but she assumes because she used those reference images that the artist is going to know that that's what she wants. One of the controversies is what I found myself in was saying, was using this as an example to tell clients what happened to her was deplorable and should never happen. Point, full stop, period. But also because I saw how the comments are going, I was like, you should always walk away from a consultation feeling like you were heard, feeling like you guys are on the same page and your artist should be guiding the conversation. But in the case where you feel like what you want has not been said out loud, you should be saying it. But I also don't blame her, but I'm just saying, like, this was just something that- Well, was she happy with the tattoo? No. So the tattoo didn't happen. The tattoo didn't happen- because when the woman sent her the drawing, it was not of a full body. It was just literally like a sketch of half the fox body. What? And she wasn't happy. And that's why she went online. So now fast forward, this woman, the tattoo artist is off the gram. Nobody, well, people found her. We've seen her tattoos. They're not bad. They're not great. They're not what they're worth. Then we come to find out that she's been taking a course through, I think, Tattoo Smart from Russ Abbott who introduced this tiered system. 
What? When I also when I first heard about this, I was having a conversation with Jasmine, and we were kind of like, I don't understand it. It still seems unethical. However, if that's what you were going to do, at least give somebody a full top to bottom completed sketch. Like this is exactly how it's going to look on your skin. I mean, black line work colored in, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you were going to use that tier system, come to find out that's what this man's tier system is supposed to look like, but still is crazy. The whole thing about his course was saying, make an extra $17,000 a year tattooing by using this tier system and artists at his shop use it. Also, she had reviews on her Google where people said that this happened to them, where they felt scammed out of things. She has a rigid no refund policy. She has a rigid no changing the design unless you pay extra for it. People are paying thousands of dollars. And Cambridge, Ontario. Wait, that's where it's happening? Girl. <laughs> True Tattoo goes to Cambridge. Wow. I don't understand why, I even, why people would even agree to that in the first place, though. That just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Totally agree. So... The baseline for my, the takeaway for me is people are trying to make the most money that they possibly can from this industry. I get why people are finding new ways to, to have, to generate more income with tattooing, but I don't know if it's a matter of a pricing increase or finding new ways to introduce in, like more income or generate more income rather than implementing stronger boundaries. Like, what do you think? I feel like obviously you can make good money tattooing without going to that extreme. Literally. She could have that system, but it doesn't have to start at 1600. Like that's just excessive and not sustainable because she's already getting called out for scamming. Like, you know what? Even if she was like doing like hyper real black and gray and everything is huge. That's the only way I could kind of see that. And even that to me be pushing it, Mm -hmm. but just for like, line drawing stuff that's apparently not super crazy i don't understand i think you can definitely raise your prices and maybe have like a similar system but the way that that's done just doesn't make sense to me especially if she misunderstood her client then she's not going to redraw anything that doesn't make sense i guess like the reason i even brought this up to like kind of tie this in is that like there's both so much access to the industry and yet so little access and so little education around it. Yeah. You know? And so like, even with trends, it's like, how are we having these conversations with our clients? Like with process, like how do they understand it? And it's like, are we doing our due diligence and like going, I wouldn't even say it's the extra mile, but like going the extra mile to make sure we're informing our clients and our followers even of like, the process and like how you're going to feel and like with styles, like how you're going to feel about something years down the line, you know, are we offering alternatives? Yeah. I remember like, um, at the other shop I worked at, there was a week where all these guys were coming in for the money rose, like on the hand. <laughs> yeah. And like the art, one of the artists is just like, so I'm just going to let you know, this is like the fifth one of these I've done this week. I don't know if that bothers you. But that seems to be like a very like popular trend right now. Is this something that you're going to like, you think, in like a few years? Because it is right on your hand. And the kid obviously didn't care. He still got his money rose. But it was like interesting to see someone be like, hey, this is clearly on trend trend right now. I don't know if you are like actually excited about doing this or you're just seeing other people doing it. But I mean, some people don't really like care to do have like unique tattoos, I suppose. People have the right to put on their bodies what they want to put on their bodies. But more often than not, if you have an intentional conversation with those folks, I feel like they they can then make a decision. I've been able to talk people out of getting certain things and then finding alternatives to things that they really do enjoy. There have been times when I haven't been successful in talking them out of getting something. And then years down the line, they've come to me and been like, I should have listened to you. Like even when it comes to placement or style or like how something is stylized, they're like, I, and now I'm getting paid to do the cover up. I was paid to do the tattoo in the first place. And now I'm getting paid to do the cover up. So, I mean, it should technically no be no skin off my back. You know what I'm saying? Like I shouldn't yeah. care, but I yeah. do care though. Cause I'm not in the game to try to make a buck. I can make money regardless. But I think in the end, that's why like, you're not the one getting called out for scamming, right? Like- nope. 
yeah, you can get away with certain things for a while, but if you're not being ethical, eventually people are going to find out, even if they didn't think so at the time. If people don't live in a bubble. They're going to eventually find out that you're like doing a lot. Okay, well, that concludes today's episode. Christopher. Yes. <laughs> really Thank you for having me. Having I'm glad on. Rihanna was a part of this. <laughs> yeah, it's fitting. It's certainly fitting. Is there anything you want to plug in? Um, any of your socials? Anything coming up for you? I guess just my Instagram. You can find me at chris.ink, K R Y S dot I N K. Same on TikTok, but I don't really be using that. But maybe I'll be, try- <laughs> I'll be trying more these days. Um, we do things. Keep an eye out. <laughs> we do be doing things. We cool. do be doing things. <laughs> That's it for today's episode, folks. Go ahead and follow at the Teardown Pod on all socials. Also, make sure to leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The podcast is hosted by me, Vegas Inc. This episode was edited and mixed by Ali Silhua and was produced in collaboration with Edit Audio. Special shout out to producers Kathleen Specker and Melissa Houghton, and I'll see you at our next session. <laughs>